The Profile. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. Hello and welcome to The Profile with me, Justin Briley, here on Premier Christian Radio, brought to you in partnership with Premier Christianity magazine. It's a monthly resource for Christians who want to connect their faith with the real world. And you can get a free sample copy at premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. Well, today on The Profile, I'm joined by Dr. Michael Gillen, a best-selling author, former Harvard physics instructor, and three-time Emmy-winning ABC News science editor. That's quite a CV. Uh, to start with. Michael is a Christian though and his new book Believing is Seeing tells the story of his own journey from being a skeptic and atheist to becoming convinced that actually science points towards a creator. So welcome along to the show Michael. Um, tell me a, a little bit about how long you've been involved then in media yourself. This, this won't be the first time you've sat down in front of a microphone will it? Oh, gosh, no, Justin. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me on your show. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. I think I started in media, if you count print as media, (laughs) uh, way back when I was a high school kid. And there's a whole story behind that um, that I think I tell in the the book. Uh, But in front of a camera, oh, my gosh, I'm going to date myself, but it's been more than three decades. Let's put it that way. (laughs) It took me a long, it's actually interesting observation on your part, because It took me a long time, and this will sound silly, but it's true, to be able to smile naturally on camera. Mm -hmm. I was doing Good Morning America. I was hired uh, back in 1988 to be on Good Morning America, which was our number one morning show here. And I would come home and I would say to my wife, how did I do? How did I do? She says, well, you did all right, but you seem so awkward and and ill at ease. And I said, why? (laughs) And, and uh, so it actually took me uh, about two years, believe it or not, to be, do, yeah. be natural in front of the camera. Well, to be honest, there aren't that many scientists who are that natural in front of the no. camera. So they frequently rise to the top when, when they do. Um, and tell me uh, about, firstly, your scientific career. When, when did that begin? And, and you know, why, why particularly did you go into the area of physics? It started about the age of seven, as best I could tell. Uh, I was in the second grade when I fell head over heels in love with science, Justin. I can't explain why. I was born and reared um, in East Los Angeles and then in the town adjacent to that, Montebello. I'd never met a scientist in my whole life. Uh, We were relatively poor by anyone's standards. Um, But there I was. And I, (laughs) I just felt this passion for science. None of my family had ever been in science. Most of them had not even gone past high school. And uh, that dream of becoming a scientist propelled me from East LA to UCLA, where I majored in physics and math. I don't know why physics in particular. Um, maybe I'm, I was just a nuts and bolts kid. I just wanted to. I just wanted to check under the hood of the universe and see, how, you know, see how it ran. I, I still have that desire. This many years later, I'm still so fascinated by how the universe works. And uh, then from uh, UCLA, I went on to Cornell. I had the intention of becoming an experimental high energy physicist, which is a fancy way of saying I wanted to study subatomic particles uh, using experiments uh, as opposed to being a theorist. But, and again, I explain this in the book, we don't have time. Um, I petitioned my chairman to switch from experimental to theoretical, and I had to jump through some hoops. Uh, I, I did that. And um, I ended up graduating with a PhD in physics, math, and astronomy. There's a whole story there. I've never been, (laughs) I've never been conventional, Justin. Anyone who tries to pigeonhole me is going to have a very hard time of it. Um, I don't set out to be a maverick. I don't set out to be a contrarian, a rebel. I, I, maybe I'm just wired like Mm. that. So, Mm. and then I went from there to Harvard and it's, it, I often say a funny thing happened to me on the way to Cambridge because I had every intention of just going to Harvard and, you know, becoming an academic. And um, I had this encounter. And again, I tell it, uh, I tell the story in the book because you can't make this stuff up. I stopped off at the Smithsonian on my way from, uh, from Ithaca to, uh, to Cambridge. 
And I had an encounter there with a television personality who asked me a question about what we call the full cult pendulum. And I was able to answer it. I thought it was a no brainer, but for whatever reason, the way I explained it or how I explained it, I don't know. He said, do you want to be in television? And I mean, that was just like out of the, out of nowhere. Cause I'm, I'm this pinhead, just this dedicated pinhead. And I, I was like, huh, well, I guess. And that ended up being that they uh, hired me at CBS, uh, the CBS morning show uh, hired me to be their science and technology yeah. contributor. So suddenly and I was just reading the poem, uh, The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. I don't know if you're familiar with it, mm. but I, I have it here because it is so apropos of my story. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler, long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. And I there are three other stanzas, I won't mm. read them, but that poem hits so close to home because at that moment I was headed to Cambridge to become an academic, but little did I know when I stopped off for just a day in Washington, DC, I was confronted with this fork in the road. Yes. And now in retrospect, I realized that the choice I was being given was to pursue my dream of becoming a scientist or to achieve my destiny. And today I'm speaking to you as a man who took that road, not that that road less traveled. And it has been an amazing life, more than I could have ever imagined. Yeah. Well, as you say, you, you tell the story very well in the book and um, and also, you know, the, the challenge of balancing this, you know, fledgling career in media with obviously your scientific studies and research and everything else. But t- tell me on a personal level, you, you grew up actually, as you say, in, in a relatively poor household. Um, you, this was in the sort of Mexican quarter of, of East Los Angeles. And um, and I think there was faith in your family. It was very much of the Pentecostal variety and not one that you particularly took with you, as far as I can see, early on in your scientific career. Tell us a bit about that. I grew up, um, my father and both my grandfathers were Spanish speaking Pentecostal ministers. Mm. And so we would go to church like seven days a week. And especially when my dad or my grandfathers were preaching, I mean, those sermons lasted like two hours. <laughs> It wasn't like today where the whole service is crammed into one hour, you know, so people can get, get, get home and watch the football game. Um, and woe to me if, uh, you know, I and my two sisters didn't sit still and listen. My mother would reach over and pinch us, uh, <laughs> not in an ugly way, but just to say, you know, keep your eyes on, <laughs> keep your eyes on, uh, on the pulpit. And no, I never owned that faith. That wasn't mine. That was my parents. Uh, Honestly, the one thing that I remember more than anything else was they would take us kids down to the basement of this church uh, in East LA and do something called Sunday school. And then they would march us back up to rejoin the grownups in the sanctuary. And I was always eager to be at the top of the line, the first in line. Why? because they allowed us kids to play the instruments, the musical instruments. Uh-huh. And I wanted the drums and I knew I was in competition for the drums. So <laughs> I always muscled my way to the front of the line. And, uh, and that was it for me. I, I didn't understand the look, I was a kid. I, and I think a lot of parents make that mistake today. Even, you know, they, they think, well, if I take my kid to Sunday school, they'll grow up, you know, a Christian, I think just the opposite sometimes happens. And of course, that's the phenomenon we're seeing today where kids growing up in a Christian church just like uh, leave it behind, go to college. And that's what happened to me. I I had no interest in the religion. I didn't absorb it at all. If anything, maybe it was a, a big turnoff for me because I remember so clearly, Justin, when we were at LAX, the airport in Los Angeles, and I was heading out to Ithaca to start my graduate studies. I said goodbye to my family, my friends, and whatever faith my parents tried to uh, pump into me. And I felt liberated. I felt Mm -hmm. like now I could be my own man. Now I could become that scientist I've always wanted to be. And I really um, quickly became a scientific monk at Cornell. And we can explore that if you wish. Mm -hmm. But really, for me, honestly speaking, I was 110% about science. I didn't care about anything or anyone else. That was my 
blinkered goal. That was my blinkered dream. And I was on top of the world. I was, yeah. I got to become a scientist at Cornell. It was awesome. I still I mean, feel that passion and that excitement. I, I mean, to some extent, to that degree, your, your story plays into the common narrative that has existed for a long time now in academic circles and culture that there's this disjunct between science and faith. And indeed, some of the most you know, well-known proponents of science in the media are, are frequently people who say, no, you know, religion is just fairy tales. Science is where the truth is at. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of people like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Richard Dawkins and others. Um, now, what happened to you, though? Why, why did those blinkers not stay on as far as you were concerned? What, what was the journey you went on that took you in a different path to those kinds of public intellectuals and science proponents who say that there is this you know, that, that faith and science can't be reconciled. And by, uh, by the way, I was one of them for many, mm. many years. I was precisely that. What made a difference in my life? Um, <clears throat> I'll preface the answer by saying that I've always been a very curious person. That is to say, I've never felt any questions out of bounds. Um, when I was in middle school, and I think I tell this story in the book, uh, I drove my math teacher crazy because I was constantly interrupting him with questions. And I didn't think twice about it. If I had a question, I answered it. I wasn't one of these little shy, you know, shrinking violets. If I had a question, I asked it. More than that, I demanded an honest answer. And I could always have a, I had a BS meter and I still have a BS meter. I can always tell when somebody is just kind of eh, giving me a, a half-baked answer or trying to hedge or whatever. No, I, I demand honest answers. And when I started teaching at Harvard, I would tell my kids the same thing. I would say, look, you're going to be graded on homework and on tests, of course, but I'm also going to grade you on class engagement. And in particular, I want you to ask questions. I don't want you to sit there. If I say something that troubles you or disturbs you, you don't understand it or you disagree with it, I need you to raise your hand and ask a question. And I I'm going to tell you straight up that the tougher the questions you ask, the better the grade you're going to get from me. And so when I was in grad school, now I come around to your question, is that by then I had learned at least two very stunning things about the universe. I, you know, millions of things about the universe by then, but two of them particularly stood out in my mind and they were like thorns in my side. Uh, number one, I learned that uh, the universe is mostly invisible. We didn't always call it dark matter. Back when I was a grad student, we call it the missing mass problem. And again, I, I, I explain this in the book. Uh, uh, Zwicky and others, other astronomers had discovered that there galaxies are rotating at, at, a, at a rate that is inconsistent with their apparent mass, which suggested to us that there was mass there that we could not see that was causing them to rotate at this abnormal speed. Uh, well, and we just shelved it. Okay, well, it's another problem. You know, that's where we are with science. Problems come up all the time. They, they sprout up like weeds in your garden. But, you know, you don't always pluck them. You don't always have the ability to pluck them. You just live with them. You, you grow to just accept them. Well, I'm not that kind of guy. Weeds bother me. <laughs> I don't want to have a worldview full of weeds. <laughs> and so uh, I like to have a nice, nice, tidy garden. And by the way, I'm into flowers as well. <laughs> the, second, the second stunning thing that we discovered that I learned as a grad student is that the universe does appear to be designed for life. Now, you don't need to use the word designed, but it's really what it is. And, you know, we can get into it if you want. And, and uh, Sir Martin Rees, one of your countrymen, have, has written a wonderful book called Just Six Numbers. Um, I, I won't get into it here unless you want to explore it. But the point is that uh, there's enormous evidence now, even more so than when I was in grad school, the, the evidence hasn't gone away. If anything, it's just multiplied that the universe appears designed for life, not the earth. I'm not talking about mm. earth. I'm talking about the entire enchilada. Mm. Uh, everything just seems to be lined up so that you and I can exist and have this conversation and the listeners can listen in. Uh, it would be a very boring world otherwise. <laughs> very, very boring universe. And so, you know, they, again, these were weeds and I kind of lived with it for a while, but they kept gnawing at me and gnawing at me. 
And finally, I just thought, you know, no, I, I really need to address these issues square on. I need to ask why this is so. Why? How did the universe come to be mostly invisible and designed for life? And I demanded honest answers. And yes, science offered me a wonderful answer in the form of the standard cosmological model. And back then there wasn't talk about inflation. Now there's talk about inflation and and Alan Guth and a bunch of other people have, have added on. And it's actually beautiful math. And I mean, the math to me still is just breathtaking. And I sometimes when I'm feeling a little bit down, I'll just look at Einstein's field equation and it'll just pep me up again because really you don't need to understand. And I say this in the book and I, and I had to include Einstein's field equation in the book, not because I assume the readers, this book is for the layperson. It's, so. it's not your average bumper sticker material, you know, Einstein's field equation. <laughs> no, it isn't, although it should be. Oh, Justin, you gave me an idea. I think I should start marketing that. I just, look, I, I just invite the reader to look upon that equation as a work of art, as you would say a De Gaulle or, uh, or you know, or a Mona Lisa or something like that. And uh, so as I was demanding honest answers, um, I flashed on something that uh, I had heard one of my professors, Carl Sagan, say. Now, at that time, Carl was just becoming famous. He was on The Tonight Show with Johnny Mm. Carson. He was getting ready to host the Cosmos series for NPR and so forth. And I had taken classes uh, with him and Frank Drake, the founders of SETI, uh, in exobiology, which is the study of life outside the earth. And uh, so I paid a lot of attention to what Carl would say. I really admired him. I still do. I think he was a fabulous communicator. Um, and I'll have, I, I, I'm so full of stories. I have to digress. I remember him giving a seminar once at Cornell, packed auditorium, and he used the word, the awe and majesty of the universe. And you know what? His fellow astronomers busted his chops about that. Well, the, uh, the words awe and majesty aren't scientific terms. Professor You know, and I've gotten some of that now, so I know how Carl must have felt. But, you know, anyway... Um, he kept, when he was being interviewed, he would oftentimes refer to the word Vedas, Vedas this and Vedas that. I didn't know what that what was. These were the days before Google. So finally, in it, when I got to this kind of the fork in the road, if you will, another fork in the road for me, um, I said, I'm going to find out. So I went to Olin Library, the grad student library on campus, and I found, lo and behold, the Vedas are the sacred literature of the Hindu religion. And so that got me very interested in Hinduism. And then I got into Buddhism and all this. I I took this, what I call Herman Hess-like journey uh, in search of other worldviews that might provide me with answers to my question. How did this mostly invisible, you know, universe designed for life come to be? And um, I was just kind of, if you've heard, I don't know if you've read Herman Hess or not, but his protagonists are always these tormented intellectuals that are Mm. dissatisfied with life and seek, you know, they take their shoes off and go on this, put on sandals and they go off on this journey in search of the deep answers to life's deep questions. Well, that was me. And, um, and ultimately it led to my exploration of Christianity. That's a whole story in itself. I went in there kicking and screaming, but here I am. (laughs) Here here I am a scientist and a Christian. Yeah. It's been a long road, Justin. It's been a long road. And and I'm sure another whole show, you know, to, to delve into that journey. But it's interesting because, in as I say, in the public mind, people like you, pe- people of science, are very often seen as being on the other side of the fence when it comes to religion and very much, uh, you know, looking at the, the way often some of these public personalities portray themselves. They, they often do say science and religion are at odds. I mean, what's been your actual experience when it comes to scientific colleagues? Do you find that there's generally um, an antagonism towards religion or are people fairly open-minded? Um, because I'm guessing not that many of your colleagues will have gone on quite the same journey as, as you when it comes to faith. I'd say it was a mixed bag. I remember uh, having one conversation with a colleague of mine at Harvard, and we were just kind of chewing the fat um and this particular person i don't want to mention names went on to win the nobel prize and uh, was a dear friend of mine he passed away sadly um just a really good friend 
Um, and uh, we were chit-chatting about uh, Robert Millikan's oil drop experiment, which in physics is very uh, important experiment because it led to our perception of charge coming in quantum packets. That is to say, electric charge comes in bundles. You can't have fractional charges, although now we changed our minds because there are quarks with a third. <laughs> a third. So that's science. It's always changing. Sure. It's like, a, uh, but, uh, uh, and Robert Millikan, you know, he was at Caltech for most of his life in Pasadena, California, and a brilliant man, got the Nobel Prize for his oil drop experiment. Again, just historic. And in the midst of this conversation, Justin, this friend of mine, who was also a Nobel Prize winner, says, but he was such a lowbrow. He was a Christian, you know. What a lowbrow. <laughs> and I was like, oh. Huh? And by then, I had already kind of I was in the midst of exploring Christianity, having explored all the other religions and uh, kind of ditched them from one for one reason or another. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. I learned something invaluable and I have a lot of respect. I, I'm not one of these people who ridicules other. It just wasn't a good fit for me, these other religions. So I was in the midst. I wouldn't call myself a Christian at that point, but I was I knew enough about the faith. I had I had read the Bible on a challenge. Uh, cover to cover for the first time in my life as a, as a grown up, as an adult, as a scientist, and I discovered some extraordinary things uh, I'd never heard anybody tell me about before. So this was jarring for me to hear this uh, esteemed colleague of mine, you know, um, d- diminishing Robert Millikan just because he was a Christian. I mean, this is a Nobel Prize winning scientist who did an historic experiment. So that represents kind of one mindset. But then there are more than you realize, and I would say maybe half or more of um, just your everyday scientists who are um, not necessarily Christians, but uh, Christians, Muslims, Jews, um, men of uh, men who have a a religious faith of some sort. And I hesitate to say religious faith because atheism is also religion. So they all have a religious faith. They just don't, they just don't admit it. I I wanted to ask you about this because this is a very key, key part of the book that you've written. Um, Believing is seeing a central aspect of that is saying that actually everyone has a worldview um, and that it's not just quote unquote religious people who have a particular worldview beliefs to defend. Everyone comes to the table with a specific set of views that I suppose we'll need defending. So talk, talk a little bit about that and, and, and why you feel you need to do that in order to understand actually why maybe the average atheist scientist needs to be able to question their particular worldview just as much as the Christian does. <clears throat> I think that's a really important question, and that is this. When I was an atheist, I shared in the conceit that somehow I was more enlightened than other people, you know, and I relished... Uh, pointing to studies that seem to indicate that uh, atheists have higher IQs than non-atheists. And, you know, we can have that discussion as well. So, uh, and I also shared in the conceit that uh, atheism and science, by the way, seem to go hand in hand. To me, it was almost like peanut butter and jelly, science and atheism. They, They were almost inseparable. And uh, the conceit was that both atheism and science are founded on logic, on granite, solid logic. And, uh, and then you have the others who, you know, Christians and Jews and Muslims and all that, and they are, their, their worldview is founded on this squishy marshmallow-like thing called faith. And of course, so we're superior because everyone, everyone knows that logic is superior to faith. So I wanted to address all of those conceits in my book, um, and I do. Um, in particular, I, I, I do it in a variety of ways, but let's, let's pursue this notion of a worldview. What is it? Well, it's exactly what the word indicates. It's the way, it's the thing in you that dictates how you see the world. In effect, uh, Justin's worldview is Justin. There's an equivalence between you and your world. It, you, your worldview is you and you are your worldview. Gillen's worldview is Gillen. There is, that defines me. It defines each and every human being on earth, past, present, and future. So what do we know about worldviews? Well, we know that they determine how you see the world and how you see the world determines how you react to the world, okay? 
I'll have more to say about that later if we have time. But in my exploration of worldviews, when I was that grad student, and I think it happened about second in my second year when I, when I was dissatisfied with the answers, elegant as they were, I was not completely satisfied with the answers that science was providing me for my one question. And I went off on this Herman Hess-like journey in search of other worldviews, alternative worldviews. Um, I discovered along the way, and I'm talking now about decades, um, Justin, I'm not talking even about months or years. This has been a decades long journey for me. I discovered that there are three essential um, features of a worldview, yours, mine, and everybody's. Number one, foundation. What is your worldview founded on? And Um, when you think about it, as I have for so long, you realize ultimately that everyone's worldview is founded on certain core beliefs, certain axiomatic beliefs that cannot be proven, period. You cannot prove them. Uh, You have to accept them on faith. So whether you're an atheist or a Christian or a Buddhist or a Muslim, that is a fact. If you are honest with yourself, if you interrogate yourself about what do you believe at your core, then you will discover that they are beliefs that you cannot prove, okay? So whether you want to believe that the universe is an accident, that's fine. Go ahead and believe that, but you can't ever prove it. You're listening to The Profile with me, Justin Briley, speaking today with Dr. Michael Gillen, best-selling author, former Harvard physics instructor, and three-time Emmy-winning ABC News science editor about his new book, Believing is Seeing. And we'll be back in just a moment. Holier than thou. Radical. Delusional. Ignorant. Perfect. It's time to challenge stereotypes about Christians, and Premier Christianity is leading the way. Transform your perceptions, broaden your horizons, open your mind to wide-ranging views. Read interviews with politicians, theologians, and TV presenters. Discover the breadth of the Christian spectrum. Be provoked, react, inspired, and informed. Get the print magazine and full online access for just £4.95 a month. Subscribe today at premierchristianity.com. Premier Christianity magazine. The bigger picture. The Profile. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. Welcome back to The Profile with me, Justin Briley, here on Premier Christian Radio. My guest today is Dr. Michael Gillen. He's a best-selling author, former Harvard physics instructor and Emmy-winning ABC News science editor. His new book is called Believing is Seeing, and I'm picking up the conversation with Michael now, talking about atheism as a worldview. When I was an atheist... My core belief was seeing is believing. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to believe it unless I can see it. But then I was thrown into a crisis when I discovered that 95% of the universe is invisible. So as a scientist, I was being, I was being told to believe in something I couldn't see, i.e. the universe, 95% of it. So that demanded an alternative to seeing is believing. And that's where I came to believing is seeing. What you believe determines what you see. We can talk more about that, but that's mm. number one. So the one essential feature of everyone's worldview is foundation. Second is size. What's the size of your <clears throat> foundation? So <clears throat> when I was an atheist, I had a rather small worldview. Why? Because in that atheist worldview, I only allow for the existence of the physical, of space and time and matter and energy. That's it. That's all there is. There's nothing more. Fine. Fine. But there are other worldviews that allow for other kinds of reality, not just physical reality, and they are much larger worldviews, okay? Third, what is at the center of your worldview, okay? So if you think of your worldview as this kind of hemisphere of reality, it's your hemisphere of reality, it's your sphere of reality, it's your bubble of reality. We all live in our bubble, bubbles of reality. They are called our worldviews, Um. At, when I was an atheist, um, at the center of my worldview was me, myself, and my dream. Period. I mean, and that's what totally uh, dictated every decision of mine, every movement, every reaction. Uh, every, I saw everything in terms of my dream. That's what got me out of East L.A. to Harvard. And, uh, and now that I'm a Christian... Um, 
I have a very different center. At the center of my worldview is not me. It's not the earth. It's not mother nature. It's not the stars. It's not the galaxies. It's not the universe. It's the creator of the universe. It's quite simple. And, um, and it's changed my whole perspective. So depending on what your foundation is, the size of your worldview, the center of worldview, your worldview, that will, that will determine who you are. And that will determine how you see the world and how you react to the world. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why is this important? I was uh, speaking at the University of Kentucky a couple of years ago. And towards the end, actually, I think we were already into the Q&A session. A little gal at the back of the auditorium to the left, to my left, I was on the stage, stood up. And I thought she was going to ask a question. But instead, she said, you know what? Uh, Dr. Gillen, we're we're all getting text here that a a student on campus has committed suicide in one of the dorms. Well, as you can imagine, the whole auditorium just went silent. And of course, we prayed for the student. I didn't know who it was. I, I read the headlines the following morning. It was very sad. Why am I bringing this up? Just to button off this discussion. And that is to say, here's why your worldview is so important. Because in times of crisis, it can either cause you to sink like a rock or soar like an eagle. I don't know who that student was who committed suicide, but this much I do know. That student's worldview let him down. That student had a dysfunctional worldview. Why? Because when push came to shove, that student's worldview said to that student, there is no hope to move on. Take your life. That's not the kind of worldview I wish on anyone, okay? I've had close brush with death. We can talk about that. Maybe not. I talk about it in the book. But your worldview in times of crisis will either be your best friend or your worst enemy. That's why it's so important. Mm, Gosh. I mean, when it comes to worldviews, very often I find it's quite difficult to persuade someone who's been in one particular way of looking at the world into a different one it's interesting because i have met many scientists and some of them are very much sort of sort of as you were in your early career you know this is the only way of seeing the world through a very physicalist naturalist perspective and then i meet some who are maybe somewhere in between and i'm thinking particularly of someone you'll i'm sure know well from physics sir roger penrose um who worked with Stephen Hawking's on Stephen Hawking on you know um uh, various theories and I've had the privilege of having him on my unbelievable show to discuss issues around the universe and God with people like William Lane Craig and others but um but he's an interesting person because he he does not subscribe exactly to the sort of scientific naturalism let's say he yeah. he believes that there is something very strange going on in our universe whereby yeah physical reality maps in an extraordinary way onto the descriptions we have of it in physics and maths and uh he can't see that you can just write this off to chance he says there's there's something unusual going and he also accepts the idea of a mental realm you know the the idea that 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 there is something distinct um and he's one of those people I think is a bit of an outlier, though, in the science, in the science. It's he, he's, you know, very often when he when he raises those kinds of issues, people will say, well, he's a bit quirky. He's a bit of, you know, um, of an eccentric. It feels like it's very difficult. Science is very bound, almost bound to this, this very naturalistic. It's just about the material evidence kind of view. How do you how do you persuade people to, to move beyond that view? What what does it take, I suppose, to, to take someone on a journey where? They may get to somewhere like Sir Roger Penrose, but beyond that to the idea of a personal God, a God who would raise someone from the dead. I mean, a lot of people feel like that's such a, such a, a, a large chasm between the, 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 the atheistic scientist and that kind of a, a worldview. How, how do you even begin going there? There is no Royal road. I wish there were, um, as I've just explained to you, it took me decades mm. Uh, When I first read the Bible on a challenge, um, it took me and this young woman who challenged me, and I tell the story in the book, two years. And the reason it took me two years, she and me, and by the way, I ended up marrying her and we're (laughs) one day away from celebrating our 30th wedding anniversary. Wow, congratulations. (laughs) 
Thank you. Um, uh, the reason it took us that long, Justin, is because we questioned every word of every verse of every chapter of every book from Genesis to Revelation. We're just both very intellectual. To the point where a couple of months in, I said to her, her name is Laurel. I said, Laurel, we're never going to get through this book in our lifetime if we keep stopping and questioning everything that this thing is saying. Uh, so we actually bought ourselves one of those spiral notebooks. And we, we wrote, as a question came up, uh, we wrote it down and we revisited it. Um, I can't say that we've addressed every single question in that book. I think it would take 10 lifetimes. But um, you're asking a very important question, and it's very deep for me, because number one, I don't think there is an easy way to persuade people to, to change their worldview. I think that's why I wrote the book. It's to challenge people. And I don't care if the person who's reading the book is already a Christian or fancies himself or herself a Christian or they, they're died in the wool atheist. Look, I respect what, who you are and what you believe if, you, if you've done the work, as I have. Um, I often say when I'm speaking on campuses, and I think this is very much an answer to your question, uh, when I'm asked that, um, and, and, and a lot of parents will come up to me all oh, teary eyed. I mean, literally, Justin, they will come up to me afterwards, after I've spoken, say, is there a way you can talk to my son or my daughter? Oh, they've gone off the cliff. And can you mm -hmm. talk to them? Of course, it's not practical for me to talk to them. And, 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 uh, so I say to whomever is genuinely interested in making certain that their worldview is founded on what I call enlightened faith, because not all faith is good. I talk about that in the book. There is misguided faith and there is enlightened faith. We all, all our worldviews are based ultimately on faith, having faith in these axiomatic beliefs of ours that we cannot prove, right? But there is misguided faith and there is enlightened faith. And, and, and so I... I wish for anyone um, wanting to uh, have a not dysfunctional worldview, but a functional worldview that will be there for them in times of crisis. I wish for their worldview to be founded on enlightened faith, okay? Faith that is consistent with the best available evidence. So how do you do that? Well, I, I have three words. Do your homework. Okay. Uh, this is what I said. I, I, I just finished writing an op-ed that should be published soon. And, and uh, the, the publication asked me to write an open letter to the college student who, do, who no longer knows what to believe. And this is what I'm telling that person, that person who maybe is in a fog of this fog of misinformation we're all trying to navigate through. What, well, how can I how can I find my way through this fog? What can I know? What, what can I know for sure is true? And who can I believe? And why wow, I see this confusion in students everywhere I travel, from New York City to Warsaw, Reykjavik to to Arizona to to Phoenix, mm. and I say to them, do your homework. And unfortunately, Justin, that's not something that happens overnight. So if you are genuinely interested in making certain that your worldview is founded on enlightened faith, that your worldview is large enough to accommodate the whole of reality. If you're interested in having a worldview that is centered on something other than you, I call that when your worldview is centered on you, I call it a geocentric uh, worldview because it's centered on this little planet called you. Uh, if you want a worldview centered on something bigger than yourself, then you've got to put in the work. You've got to do your homework. And that means don't just listen to me and don't even just read my book. Mm. Read my book, yes. But when you read my book, I believe it's going to send you off on your own Herman Hess-like journey. And you'll read other books like Penrose, like Reese, like mm. Fred Hoyle, like, you know, all of whom are flavors of atheists, but they are honest atheists. And I find to put a button on this, quite frankly, that over the years, I've known more than my share of Nobel Prize winners. And this is what I find, and this is anecdotal. I'm not, I'm not trying to present mm. this as some kind of a scientific survey. It is not. It's just been my experience that very intelligent scientists um, um, 
are tempted to be conceited. And they, they are the ones that you tend to find are the very aggressive atheists, okay? They're better than, they're smarter than the average scientist. They're maybe in some kind of an elite a layer. But when you go beyond, when you go above even that into the stratosphere, into the Nobel Prize winners, these truly brilliant men and women, mm -hmm. they are more open. They are more open, just like you described Penrose. Yeah. I find mm -hmm. that very interesting. Mm -hmm. Leon Letterman, who was a dear friend of mine, Nobel Prize winner, wrote the book, The God Particle, um, is one of them. Uh, but I have, I have, it's intriguing, and I haven't thought it through why, but I do believe it's that when you really are honest about reality, you realize there's more to reality than just mm. space, time, matter, and energy. The the there's there's a famous quote, and I'm I'm trying to remember who who it's attributed to. Um, but it goes something like this: the first sip from the glass of the natural sciences will turn a person into an atheist, but when they get to the bottom, they will find God there waiting for them. It's it's a sort of it's that thing of of it's very often. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's only at that shallow level that that yes. we sort of think well this explains everything yes. but once we get to the limits of what we know we realize it opens up far bigger questions um that often have god waiting at, at the end of them and um, worse than that even justin yes. are people who know nothing about science and have this very strong opinion which i come across all the time that science equals atheism and it's like you know nothing about science you probably haven't even read the Bible like me when I was younger, right? And yet they have the strongest opinions about this dichotomy. And, and frequently know little of the history of science either, which oh, yes. as, as anyone who knows it will know that it was very much founded, you know, in Christian history by people who were believers, who believed that this was a way of understanding the world because there was a regularity to nature that was invested in you, the universe by a God who, who put it there. But let's talk about the title of the book, because you say you went from this, this worldview of seeing is believing. And obviously the book reverses that to believing is seeing. Now, what, what does that mean? Does that mean, Oh, we just believe things, um, you know, because we feel like they're true now, presumably it's not quite that. What, what do you mean by believing is seeing? It goes back to what I said about worldviews, that first thing, foundation. What's the foundation of your worldview? It, uh, the foundation of everyone's worldview are certain axiomatic beliefs, okay? And those beliefs, those are the things you believe to be mm. true. You mm. can't prove them. You just accept them as your core beliefs. And guess what? They will determine how you see the world. Believing is seen. Mm. See, so if I believe, for example, that um, I'm a bird, then I will see myself flying through the air. Okay. And I mean, there I speak about um, uh, it's kind of a, a, kind of a distasteful example, but it's unfortunately part of what's happening in today's world. I talk about this kind of mental case who believes he's a nine-year-old girl and he was into all this porn and he was brought to justice in our country and the judge interrogated him and he said well you know how can you possibly excuse your behavior he says judge i've always believed that i was a nine-year-old girl and because he believes that he's a nine, that is the foundation of his worldview and talk about a dysfunctional worldview talk about misguided faith it caused him to see the world in such a wicked way that it caused him to see that his looking at this porn, there was nothing wrong with it. Mm. Now, how do you cope with that? I mean, obviously, that's a, that's a pathological example. Mm. But there are many people walking around today with a worldview that is not necessarily that pathologically dysfunctional, but that is functionally, that it, but that is practically dysfunctional like this student that I spoke about at the University of Kentucky, who had such a dysfunctional worldview that it caused him to commit suicide, to give up hope in life, okay? So that's what I mean by believing is seen. Let me, let me, let me mm -hmm. button it up this way. Unless you, let's say you have, God forbid, a terminal illness, okay? Unless you believe that modern science can help you you're never going to see for yourself whether it can or not. You see, your beliefs blinker your reality. Your beliefs, 
will either expand or limit your reality of what you can see as possible or impossible. Uh, if you don't believe that someone has written you a love letter uh, as being sincere, you're never going to see for yourself whether that person sincerely loves you or not, unless you're willing to do the homework, unless you're willing to explore the possibility that that person loves you, you will never see for yourself. You understand what I'm saying? Mm. And so now carry it over to God, unless you're willing to believe at least in the possibility that God exists. I'm not even asking you to believe that God exists. I wouldn't do such a thing to you. I'm, I'm not that superficial. I'm not that flippant. I'm not that glib. But unless you're willing to believe in the possibility that God exists, you are never going to do the homework to see for yourself whether he does or not. I did. It took mm. me decades, but I did the homework. That's why my faith, my belief, my worldview is founded on faith that is so rock solid because I've asked myself all the tough questions. I say to kids when I'm at the Q&A sessions at universities around the world, we're opening it up Q&A, and I don't mean to sound full of myself, but I doubt that any of you will ask me a question tonight that I haven't already asked myself years and years and years ago. It, I've, I've got my own interesting story of, of the way worldviews affect uh, what we're willing to even countenance in a way. So um, I had two people on, and again, you might be familiar with these, these two people on my unbelievable show. Um, one of them was Hugh Ross, who's um, quite a well-known astrophysicist, runs an organization called Reasons to Believe as a Christian. Uh, the other was um, an atheist chemist, um, Peter Atkins from Oxford University, quite a well-known Richard Dawkins type atheist. And we got to a point in the conversation where they'd been going over the scientific evidence, you know, for the beginning of the universe, the fine tuning of the universe and those sorts of issues. And eventually Peter, who had been simply dismissing all of this as lazy thinking and, you know, I said, what, what sort of evidence could, in principle, convince you that there might be a God behind the universe, Peter? And I, I gave him some examples. I said, you know, what if the stars lined up to spell Peter, I'm here? And he said, well, it could be advanced alien technology. You know, I said, all right, what if Jesus appeared to you in this room and told you that he's real? He said, well, I just assumed my, I was having a brain, mal brain malfunction. And I said, well, at this point, it doesn't sound like what you need is more physical evidence at this point. It, it sounds like you're so wedded to your naturalist worldview that you will interpret it, all the evidence through that worldview. Um, and, and to that extent, I think there are sometimes people who who don't just need to be given more evidence because they're only going to look at that evidence through their worldview. They won't even countenance the idea that they're so. So so I suppose that's that's the the, the, the issue, isn't it? It's, it's helping people to kind of move beyond their worldview to actually open up to a different kind of possibility, step into a different story, even different way of looking at the world. And, and that, that I think is sometimes the problem in my experience with apologetics. We think, well, as long as I just give someone enough evidence, they'll change their mind. It's not always that simple. Is it Michael? No, it isn't. And honestly, that's why I don't debate anybody. I'm often invited to do debates. Uh, I just find they're not an effective way to communicate. Usually you spend most of your time responding to your opponent's questions, which may or may not be relevant. Uh, <clears throat> I think this is a perfect case in point. I also find that debates don't change people's minds. And honestly, for me, ultimately too, I'm not in that business. I know there are others, perhaps this chemist that you're referring to is in the business of trying to, you know, change. I'm going to change your mind, Justin. You've got it all wrong, Justin. You know, and I often find there, you know, I, 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 I in a book that I wrote many years earlier um, called Can a Smart Person Believe in God? I speak about the different denominations of atheism because there are just as there are many different denominations of Christianity. And the one, unfortunately, that gets the most attention are what I call these kind of aggressive atheism. It's that, you know, it, they're not content with just believing what they're believing. They just have to browbeat you into believing how they believe. And if you just won't conform they will just embarrass you, humiliate you, taunt you, you know, just, it's so silly. It's so childish. It's like, get a life. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, and uh, I don't see myself as an, even an aggressive Christian. Sure. There are aggressive Christians and I, I don't like that. I, I, I feel, look, here's, here's how I see myself in a nutshell. 
I see myself as someone not trying to persuade you to think the way I do. I'm not on your show right now, honestly, to defend a point of view or even defend Christianity or even defend the truth. Mm. Um, I remember Charles Spurgeon, I believe he was the one who's credited with fir- first saying, uh, truth is like a lion. It does not need defending. All you have to do is set it free and it will defend itself. And so that's all I'm doing with my book and on this show. And whenever I'm interviewed anywhere, I'm just trying to set truth free by speaking as truthfully as I can in, in, with as much love and compassion and empathy as I can, because I was once those that atheist. So I, I know where they're coming from. I don't feel an antipathy. I don't feel like I want to debate them or change their minds or be hostile to them. No, I don't. I just feel nothing but love for them and compassion and empathy. And so I see myself ultimately as someone who's been on a journey, who is still on a journey, um, who is simply sharing what he's learned on this journey in the hopes that it will help you on your journey. Mm -hmm. And if it does, fantastic. That will make me happy. Um, But if it doesn't, all right, it's Mm -hmm. God bless you. And, and that's why I have, you know, this podcast science plus God. And I, I call the people who listen to it and people listening to it from all over the world, including England, um, Australia, Africa, I get messages from everywhere. I call them my fellow travelers. And by the way, I have atheists listening. I've engaged wonderful atheists. They're constantly writing on my Facebook page and I have these ongoing wonderful. And I, it's because I am not an aggressive Christian. I did the homework. I came to this conclusion. I present the evidence for why I had to come to this conclusion. I was really forced to come to that conclusion by the evidence. I say it in the book. I lay it all out. But if you come to a different conclusion, that's fine. And uh, like with your chemist friend, yes, there are some people who you can present them all the evidence you want in the world. And their worldview is so blinkered. Their worldview is so constrained and so tightly circumscribed and kind of locked down. I call them locked and loaded that you you can present them any kind of evidence and they'll always refract it through the lens of their worldview in a way that makes it amenable to the worldview. Mm-hmm. You know, there's just no, uh, what does the Bible say? There are none so blind who will not see. And I think that's, uh, unfortunately, there are people like that. On the other hand, there are atheists who are honest, like Penrose maybe, mm-hmm. and like Hoyle, by the way, I got to know mm-hmm. Fred Hoyle because he was a visiting professor at Cornell when I was a grad student. And, you know, Fred was a professed, self-professed atheist, but he was a very honest atheist. And he confessed, he's written books, talked about how the evidence does, does point to a higher intelligence, a higher intelligence monkeyed with, I think he used the phrase, monkeyed with the, with the works of the universe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I love having discussions with those kind of atheists. But people who are like closed-minded, what's the point? Really, what's the point? I mean, you're not, you're going to just waste a lot of time on Indeed. Well, look, I tell you what wouldn't be a waste of time uh, for anyone who's listening to go and pick up a copy of the book, Believing is Seeing. It's by Michael Gillen. And uh, you'll find out about Michael's life, um, his faith, his science, and how he put everything together in the end. And it may be helpful for someone who's on a journey. I'm sure there have been people who've been in touch over the years as they've heard your story on stage, but also now in book form, Michael, who for whom it has been, I'm sure, helpful in helping them to to put the pieces together themselves. Is that the case? That's my hope. Really, at the end of the book, I I have a quiz called Put Your Faith to the Test. Um, It's not a question of whether you are a person of faith or not. As I've just explained uh, with you, everyone is a person of faith. The only question really is, is your faith misguided or is it enlightened? And I, I I define those terms in the book. And at the end of the book, I say, put your faith to the test. Be honest with yourself. Um, Research indicates that by age 26, most of us have locked and loaded our worldview. Again, I was an outlier. I was 26 and I was still on that Herman Hess-like journey. I was still seeking. 
And I'm hoping out there, no matter whether you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, even if you're a centenarian, it's never too late. Be honest with yourself. Does your worldview, um, is your worldview founded on enlightened faith or misguided faith? And the only way you're going to tell is if someone challenges you. And that's what I do in this book. And I don't care if you call yourself a Christian or a Buddhist or a Muslim or an atheist. I am challenging you with this book right here, right now. Put your worldview on a hydraulic lift like a car and look underneath it and see what makes it tick. Because whatever makes it tick is what's pulling your strings. And you want to know, I would assume, that what's pulling your strings is something healthy, Mm -hmm. something that is life affirming, not death affirming. Something that will enable you to see the universe in its full majesty, to use Carl Sagan's words, with its full awe and majesty. Because if you only look at the universe with logic, and I explain in the book that logic is actually a very simple-minded way of reasoning. I know it's, it's vaunted in our society today. Certainly atheists you know, celebrate logic as if it were the gold standard of reasoning. It isn't. Sorry to break it to you. Any, your average garden variety mathematician will explain to you why that is such a silly notion. Mm -hmm. Logic is actually the most childish way of reasoning. It dates back 2000 years to Aristotle. And we know so much more about other ways of reasoning that are far more enlightened and more interesting and deeper. And in science, we are tapping into these. I call it translogical thinking. Um, And so my hope with this book is that whether you're going through a crisis right now or everything is happy-go-lucky with you, um, sooner or later, you are going to be put to the test. And really what I'm saying is your worldview is going to be put to the test. Mm. So you can get away with all kinds of misguided faith. You, could, you can go through many years of your life believing that you're a bird and that you can fly. But one day you're going to find yourself stranded on top of a very tall building. And the only way out is to jump off that cliff. And if you think you can fly, you're going to be in for a very rude awakening. At those moments of crisis, your bubble of reality will come face to face with absolute reality. And if there is a disconnect, if there is a dissonance between your reality and absolute reality, you're in for a very bad time of it. Mm -hmm. And I want you to avoid that. That's why I wrote this book. Well, again, the name of the book is Believing is Seeing. Dr. Michael Gillen, thank you very much for being my guest on the profile. I wish I had more time to 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 talk to you about all the anecdotes you have of all these fascinating people you've spent time with, but our time is up for today. But thank you very much for being my guest on the show today. Thank you, Justin. It, it was just the most wonderful conversation. God bless you. You've been listening to The Profile with me, Justin Briley, here on Premier Christian Radio. Do remember, you can get a free sample copy of our sister magazine, Premier Christianity magazine, by going to their website at premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. And we'll be back with another Christian in some walk of faith and life the same time next week.